Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. Looking back at the history of South Africa through colonial rule and apartheid, the cards were actively stacked against black participation in business and in the professions. But there were many who took on the biz white business establishment during the 70s, 80s and 90s. One of those at the forefront fighting for economic empowerment, especially for women, was Wendy Lohabe. She has made a name for herself as a businesswoman, social entrepreneur, economic activist, thought leader, mentor, and author. She is here today to talk about her book, Defining Moments, Experiences of Black Executives in South Africa's Workplace. Wendy, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jill. Good morning Good and to your viewers. Thanks. Uh, so tell me the reason why you chose to write about this specific period in the history of business in South Africa, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Well, I realize that today is exactly 16 years ago when I wrote the book, because oh. it was written in 2002 in August. So it's an interesting coincidence. I looked at these three decades because they each had very defining features. So the 70s was the decade when young people challenged the authorities of South Africa because their parents had let them down. It was also the era when the first so-called black managers made an appearance in corporate South Africa. People like Madala Mpatlele who passed away, uh, Eric Mafuna is still alive, Horace Mbanza amongst many others. The 80s was the decade when we began to see an increase in the number of black people enter corporate South Africa. We also began to see the emergence of women it's, for example, uh, the era where the first black woman got an MBA, uh, Connie Ngosi. Also the era where a black woman began to sit, to sit on corporate boards, uh, Marina Maponya. So you can see that each of these de decades had very, very rich uh, insights for, 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 for black executives. The 90s, of course, is, um, is the decade that ushered in our democracy and, and witnessed the pioneering initiatives of economic empowerment, uh, organizations like WePold, Nail, Real Africa, Worldwide, um, amongst others. So each of these decades, I, th I think, is quite instructive for, for us even today. You know, when we cast our eye back and we see how far we've come over the 30 years, um, you know, if you don't include Mm -hmm. the, the period during our democracy. Yeah. So you would recommend it for people going into business today? Absolutely, mm -hmm. for both black and white um, employees because it helps to give a perspective to white employees about the challenges that black people have to deal with by the time they get to the office mm -hmm. and, and the, you know, wh what they have to surmount to come mm -hmm. and, and compete on an equal basis. So there's an assumption that the starting and the field play is, is equal, and it's not. It's not equal. Yeah, we assume today, after all of the years that have gone in between, that these problems have disappeared. They haven't disappeared, sadly. Mm. I mean, black people are continue to be presumed incapable and incompetent, even though we, we have many examples of how well black people have done and the education that they have acquired over the years, which during the apartheid era was reserved for white people only. We didn't have black people who were allowed to study accounting, for example, who were allowed to study engineering. In the 80s, I was amongst the first generation of black women to have a commerce degree, for example. That was actually came about quite by accident. You wanted to go into social sciences. Yeah, it did because um, in the 80s when you went to university, or in the 70s, which is when I started uh, my university education, you actually, as a black woman, your only option was social sciences. And that's what I began to study at the University of Forte. And that was disrupted by 1976. And I decided very consciously that I needed to complete my education in an environment that would not be affected by disruptions and went to Lesotho, which didn't offer social sciences. And so that's how I really ended up choosing to do commerce, quite by fluke, quite, quite frankly. 
But it has, over the years, it has allowed me to integrate both social sciences and the commerce mm -hmm. education in the work that I've done. So it defined over the your years. future. It in, did, in but <laughs> quite by accident. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a, a well thought out, well advised, well guided uh, decision. Mm -hmm. So if we look back, it is actually quite a very long history that has stacked the cards against black business. Um, the education system was skewed to make it difficult for them. Is that the main reason why this perception still exists? Probably it does, but I think what has remained is the psychological discrimination mm -hmm. that continues to presume something that no longer exists. You know, that because we were products of Bantu education, which was designed to keep black people in an inferior mm -hmm. employment um, position and keep the, 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 you know, the popular expression, keep women in their place, mm -hmm. so to speak. And I think that a lot of people in the workplace have not moved on, have not moved further away from that reality and have not allowed what they experience today to inform the decisions that they make about people. So that prejudice is still very deeply seated mm -hmm. in a lot of people that allows them to overlook what people can contribute mm -hmm and um, that makes it difficult for them to recognize that having different views about issues does not necessarily mean that you are incompetent. Mm -hmm. Now you've interviewed quite a number of people. How, were, how did you choose the sample and how was the research done? We wanted people who represented each decade, first of all, and who were trailblazers during each of those decades and who had done extremely well over the 30 years that we were looking at. So we combined three different approaches to the research. We interviewed all the executives that are featured in the book whose stories mm -hmm. are really the backbone of the book. We conducted group discussions to verify the experiences from the number of people that are featured in the book. And then we worked with a team at uh, Vets Business School who did literature uh, research to provide the context that collaborated the, the personal experiences that people were describing around institutional discrimination, for example, and, and you know, the various themes that the book uh, talks about. Through the three decades, things changed slightly in each decade of to, uh, for black business people. Um, but one thing that remained a constant was a lack of recognition. I suspect that the that really affected people's confidence. You know, when you have the education and you know that you have a lot to contribute, but you're not allowed the opportunity to do that, and, and, and that the recognition is withheld, it, withholding recognition of what people can contribute is almost a deliberate way to, to um, invalidate people. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the, the withholding of, of, of recognition was probably the cruelest manifestation mm -hmm. of apartheid upon people who really had something to contribute. Because when you are not validated in an environment where you know you have something to contribute, and I think the, the result of that is that we, we created, we, we institutionalized mediocrity, first of all, because we did not allow other people who are different from ourselves to challenge us. And the second thing that we did is that we, we deprived the South African economy of the opportunity to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Because you can only grow and be competitive if you allow other people who are different from the way that you have approached uh, business to, to participate and to contribute. So it, 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 it had an unfortunate irony, you mm -hmm. know, that by defending your own vested interests, which I, I presume it would be the intention behind withholding recognition of the contribution and the value that other people have and represent, you, you actually you deprive the whole in a way. Mm -hmm. Now looking at the psychological impact of this as well, you mentioned I think in your chapter on the 80s um, where you have examples of people talking to you that they felt that they didn't get the support they needed from their own black colleagues. I, I mentioned that 
incident and, and I don't know what else to call it, deliberately because um, I wanted to, to communicate that the pressures of survival for, for black executives in a very um, intimidating, perhaps would be one word, and unwelcoming mm -hmm. environment forced people to, 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 to pursue their self-interests. They, you know, looking after one another and, and holding each other's hand was a luxury at mm -hmm. the time. I think that when you are in a, a minority of people in, in an environment that clearly doesn't want you to be there and is, is allowing you to be there perhaps because it, you know, the, the circumstances, forces that to happen, it, 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 um, it generates a, um, a response from the people who are feeling under attack, because we felt under attack. It generates a response where of self-preservation, um, you know, that thinking of someone else and being helpful to someone else is, is actually a luxury, because mm -hmm. you yourself are trying to, to survive. Mm -hmm. Is that what spurred you to become so uh, very dedicated to the idea of mentorship? Yes, yes. Should there be an official mentorship system? In a lot of companies, there are official mentorship systems, but I don't think that they work. I think that there's, there's mixed results out of that. Mentorship only works where a person really believes in you and has a vested interest in your growth and your development. And that's not a natural thing mm -hmm. to happen in the workplace, given our, our history. You know, because a lot of the people who would have the experience to pass on in any South African workplace would be white people. Mm -hmm. you know, so they have to be willing. You know, I, I'm always reminded uh, of something that Fancel Slabat uh, said many years ago, that South African, white South Africans have to be willing to cooperate with the country for us to really make progress and for us to allow democracy to bear mm -hmm. the fruits that it is able to. Mm -hmm. If white South Africans do not cooperate with the transformation agenda, so you know, mm. it, 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 will, it will always be a very slow pace, mm. a very slow process. You know, I think that for us to become one nation, I always say that I long for the day that we will see ourselves as South Africans first, and then as whatever ethnic group we belong to, because it's only when we reach that position that we will be able to be aligned behind a common vision mm. and, and, and really see the value of being united as a nation. We can't build one nation if we, we continue to protect you know, our tribal interests and our group interests. Mm -hmm. We can't imprison young people to the past. We have to, to free them to build a common future and a shared, to, a, a shared future together. The reason for the book as well is how the past can influence us to make better choices yes, and ensure a absolutely, better future. Absolutely. Wendy Luabi, thank you so much for coming thank in you and for the chatting to us. And bringing the book back to life again <laughs> after 16 years. The book again is Defining Moments, Experiences of Black Executives in South Africa's Workplace. And that's it for today. See you again soon.